Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Church of Utica. I'm Carol Gable, a member of the board and worship committee. Whether you are visiting for the first time or have been a member for many years, you are welcome here. Whatever faith you have known, if any, you are welcome here. Whoever you are and whomever you love, you are welcome here. We are invited to bring our whole selves to this worship service, our, our doubts as well as our convictions, the pain and joy we have known, our longing for connection and understanding. Every part of you is welcome here. I just have a brief announcement about uh, the circle, listening circles this past week. Thank you uh, to all of you who participated. Um, it was great feedback that we received and you'll be receiving, um, the board will be sharing a communication about uh, next steps this week. I am honored to introduce our guest speaker, Patrick Johnson. Many of you know Patrick because he is well known in Utica and the surrounding area as a community leader and an advocate for racial justice. Several of you have attended workshops he leads on understanding racism. He has served our community for many years and in so many ways. Some of these include his work as a life skills counselor at the Resource Center for Independent Living in Utica, as the director of the Racial Justice Department for Utica's YWCA, he works at Mohawk Valley Community College, assisting formerly incarcerated students enroll and succeed. He is a member of the Oneida County District Attorney's team and director of Save Our Streets, which aims to eliminate gun violence in Utica. As a part of these efforts, he works directly with gang members and individuals who are at risk of being vulnerable to this violence. Patrick, we are so grateful for your work and for your speaking with us today. Let us open our hearts and minds to the experience of community and the wisdom of love. Hi, everyone. My name is Esti. Smith, and I am here to represent St. Matthew's Temple Church of God in Christ, where my pastor is the superintendent, Reverend J.L. Griffin, and I am honored to be here. I'm thankful for the request by Miss Melissa from the UU Church Unification Church. I thank her for even uh, thinking of me and I would like, also like to thank Mr. Uh, Dwayne Ingram for uh, referring me and to Mr. Patrick Johnson for doing what he is about to do today and just helping us to understand what's going on. I hope you enjoy the song that I'm about to do and it encourage you to keep the faith.
call to worship this morning is And Yet You Persist by Reverend Gretchen Haley. Though you have been warned and given plenty of explanations, reasons to do otherwise, you have persisted to claim a life of joy and justice to carve out this time, this space for the renewal of your own heart. Despite all the reasons, the resistance fighting for your attention, luring you towards fear, you persist to practice gratitude for this day, this life that has been given, this chance to begin again. And so let us gather that we might offer one another courage, strength, healing, hope, and this promise to persist in kindness, persevere in compassion and prevail in a life that is for more than ourselves. Come, let us worship together. And feel free to stay on mute and join in in our hymn, uh, 1009, Meditation on Breathing. When I breathe in, I'll breathe in peace. When I breathe out, I'll breathe out love when I breathe in. I'll 
breathe in peace when I breathe out. I'll breathe out love when I breathe in. I'll breathe in peace when I breathe out. I'll breathe out love when I breathe in. Joy and grief, health and sickness, light and darkness, peace and anger, life and death, wholeness and brokenness. We each bring all of these things here to the sanctuary of unity and diversity. For one hour of this day and pour them out commingling the oil of our lives to become the flame of this chalice, the symbol of our shared living faith. Hi everyone, welcome to Together Time. I know that we're all really eager to get to today's guest speaker, so I've got a really short book for you today. It is called Anti-Racist Baby, and it's by Ibram X. Kendi, who you might know from his adult nonfiction works, like How to Be an Anti-Racist and Stamped from the Beginning, uh, with illustrations by Ashley Lukashevsky. So here we go, Anti-Racist Baby. Anti-Racist Baby is bred, not born. Anti-Racist Baby is raised to make society transform. Babies are taught to be racist or anti-racist. There's no neutrality. Take these nine steps to make equity a reality. One, open your eyes to all skin colors. Anti-racist baby learns all the colors, not because race is true. If you claim to be colorblind, you deny what's right in front of you. Two, use your words to talk about race. No one will see racism if we only stay silent. If we don't name racism, it won't stop being so violent. It's okay. I'm just lying. Three, point at policies as the problem, not people. Some people get more while others get less because policies don't always grant equal access. Four, shout, there's nothing wrong with the people. Even though all races are not treated the same, we are all human, anti-racist baby can proclaim. Five, celebrate all our differences. Anti-racist baby doesn't see certain groups as better or worse. Anti-racist baby loves a world that's truly diverse. 
Six, knock down the stack of cultural blocks. Anti-racist baby appreciates how groups speak, dance, and create as they choose. Anti-racist baby welcomes all groups voicing their unique views. Seven, confess when being racist. Nothing disrupts racism more than when we confess the racist ideas that we sometimes express. Eight, grow to be an anti-racist. Anti-racist baby is always learning, changing, and growing. Anti-racist baby stays curious about all people and isn't all-knowing. Nine, believe we shall overcome racism. Anti-racist baby is filled with the power to transcend, my friend, and doesn't judge a book by its cover, but reads until the end. And that's it. That's the whole story. So that was Anti-Racist Baby by Ibram X. Kendi. And I will see you next time with another great story. Until then, bye-bye. Please remember that though we cannot collect our plate offering in person, if you would like to continue to support our mission to nurture spiritual community, honor diversity, and advocate for social advocate for social justice, please donate online or send a check every month or so to the church with plate in the memo line. Now we will practice community candles, which is an opportunity for the congregation to be with one another as we mark notable things happening in our lives. If you would like to light a candle where you are, please do so and in frame if you would like. If you would like to briefly share about a significant event in your life and have me light a candle, please unmute yourself or type into the chat. You can also privately message me in the chat to light a candle in silence for you. I light a fi final candle here now for any unspoken joys and concerns of people here with us today. And I know we all have hope for the future coming. We'll now have our meditation prayer. This is uh, Seeking That Which Unites Us by Reverend Sarah Eileen Lawal. In this time when rhetoric blusters about and words are used as weapons, may we remember we are a people, oh, a people of resilience. We have faced uncertainty before. We have weathered storms. We have been consumed by flames. We have risen like the phoenix from the ashes and we will again. May we remember our shared humanity, our universal kinship, our interdependence as we unclench our fists and breathe together. Before reading this poem by Langston Hughes, I want to tell you why I selected it. When I was 15, I saw the movie A Raisin in the Sun, which stars Sidney Poitier and tells the story of a black family living in the south side of Chicago. It left a huge impression on me. I went to the library to read about it and learned it was originally a play which premiered on Broadway in 1959, the year I was born. I learned that it was the first play on Broadway written by a black woman and the first play on Broadway directed by a black man. 
I learned that the title was from a poem by Langston Hughes, a prolific writer considered by many to be the poet laureate of African Americans. His poems have jazz and blues like rhythms and contain themes of social injustice, history and race relations. I read them today and find them to be just as relevant as when I first read them as a teenager. Mm -hmm. A Dream Deferred was published in 1951. What happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun or fester like a sore and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat or crust and sugar over like a syrupy sweet? Maybe it just sags like a heavy load or does it explode? We'll now hear from our guest, Patrick Johnson. Good morning, everyone. First of all, I'd like to extend how deeply grateful I am to be a guest of the Universalist Unitarian Church. I'd certainly like to thank Carol for initially extending the invitation. And, you know, I saw some of the faces. I'm familiar with some of you, and you've supported the work that I've been able to do throughout the year. So I salute you and thank you. I'd also like to extend my gratitude to St. Matthew's Church uh, that I attend regularly from time to time and uh, also extend my gratitude and admir admiration to Reverend J.L. Griffin. Uh, I'd like to thank Backwoods, Estina Smith, and to all of you that delivered the meditations, the poems, and the readings, and all of that uh, for this day and for this service. So again, thank you. I've entitled this presentation, which I think that all of you are familiar with. I figured that it was timely. And even though I want to preface before I start reading, saying that there are many things to be grateful for, even in a climate of an uncertain world. Certainly we are in a pandemic. We see national unrest regularly now. And so we are in unprecedented times. The theme and the topic for this presentation is understanding white supremacy and racism and its impact on our local community. Certainly we all remember that day on May 25th, the death of George Floyd. What I'd like to share with you is that prior to that horrific day in the death of George Floyd, I would frequently, although quietly, wish that America, and particularly, and I say this respectfully, particularly, I, al I would always wish that the leaders in this country and white people would pay more attention to the issue of race relations as they do on other topics. My quiet hope is that their focus, their energy, and their time, that from time to time that they would place race and racism as a priority, but it almost never gets mentioned until there's a crisis. So at least that was my, what I noticed. For millions of black men and women, and even teenagers, when we saw that video on May 25th, with the police officer putting his knee in the neck of George Floyd, many of us knew that at any given time, that could have been us or someone we knew. We also knew that police brutality and the murder of black people by police in this country was nothing new. So when we saw that video, we knew that that happened far too frequently in this country where we say justice for all. The police officer that had his knee on the neck of George Floyd from all outward appearances displayed depraved indifference in that tra tragic, horrific incident. It appeared to be nothing short of police brutality. It has happened in California, middle America, in the south, along the eastern seaboard, 
Baltimore, Brooklyn, and even right here in Utica, New York. I say that with all due respect to the many, many good police officers that serve in that noble, uh, noble profession. But unfortunately, contrary to what we think, there are many bad actors in the policing profession. I often wondered during those eight minutes, and I wondered if you thought of it, what was the police officer thinking during those eight minutes that he had his knee on the neck of George Floyd? What was he wondering? Did this police officer have issues, unresolved issues with black people in general? The question is, would he have done that to somebody who was white? We don't know, but that's what went through my mind. And I think it's a question that we can all, regardless of our racial identity, ask ourselves, do we sometimes take our unresolved issues and unfairly put them or misdirect them on other people? I'm not saying it as an accusation, it's a question that we can all ask ourselves. And certainly it was a question that I wondered about when we saw that video. What was he thinking? Did he misdirect his issues onto that black body of George Floyd? Since that tragic day of May 25th, we have placed a substantial amount of attention on police reform in this country. We've been looking at implicit bias, institutional racism, and namely been looking at law enforcement and the legal institution, and rightfully so. The mere fact that policing in and of itself in this country started with people being hired to catch runaway slaves. Keeping that in mind, there's never really been a real true love affair with black communities and police. That's not to dismiss the fact that there are many good police officers and who serve our communities, but I'm suggesting that the profession of policing of itself, we need to really think about what that means and how different communities are policed. Many black and brown people don't trust police, simply don't trust police because of the many incidents that have happened in this country, like George Floyd. But really where I wanna take these few minutes, I think that there's another racism in this country, and I say this respectfully, that many white people don't see. Even good, well-intentioned white people. What am I referring to? I'm talking about how many black and brown people are treated in predominantly white spaces. So I wanna move this from the profession of policing and invite you respectfully to think about other public spaces and professions and how black people are treated. It's the other need that we aren't talking about. It's a silent virus, but it is a killer especially to black people. But it's something that we're not talking about. And I wanna bring it, I wanna localize this issue to right here in Utica, the Mohawk Valley in Oneida County. And I want to remind us and reiterate that I think that this is a good community, but with a whole lot more potential than what we display. We often tout our diversity in this community the 40 different languages, but it doesn't mean that we are exempt from racism and white supremacy. And when I say white supremacy, I'm not talking about the KKK. I'm not talking about neo-Nazis or white nationalists or the malicious group, militia groups that we often hear about. Certainly that is an example of white supremacy. The white supremacy that I'm talking about is an American culture. It is baked into the fabric and embedded in many systems, institutions, and organizations, even right here in Oneida County.
many of us have noticed a climate here in this community that is not necessarily inviting for people of color. For black and brown people, particularly those who are fortunate to have a job in spaces that are predominantly white, we notice that many employers and, and professions, particularly in healthcare, in our education system, in our schools, colleges, media, banking, lending institutions, our legal profession, and in our government, yes, racism lives there. It's all over. Racism and white supremacy is the silent killer of black and brown people. And ultimately, it also comes back to haunt our white brothers and sisters as well. So right now, here in our country, we have an opportunity in this era where many institutions have been looking at the issue of racism. And the question is, what are we going to do about it? I salute the work that you are doing in the UU Church, your advocacy, for the rights of all people, being a welcoming church. And I know that you are given your history. Historically, racism has been seen as a problem for the black people. And I'm suggesting that we need to flip it and white people given the power and the privilege and the resources and the voices that you have, there's a work for you to do. And I know that some of you are doing that. So I don't want that to be missed. But the white supremacy that I'm also talking about is that often that there is a tone and mannerisms that are displayed amongst many, I'm not saying all, but many white people toward people of color that comes across as indifferent, insensitive, arrogant. One of the components of white supremacy is white dominance and white people simply being oblivious and blind to the experiences of black and brown people. The question that I would love to ask for our local employers, elected officials, human resources departments, college professors, our mayors, and all other elected officials is, are you willing to hear the pain and the everyday experiences that people of color and especially black people are experiencing right here. This is not to suggest that our elected officials don't care, that our leaders don't care. But what I notice as a black man in this community is that it seems, and I say this respectfully, if I had an audience of all of them right here, right now, is it seems that the issue of race and racism does not come up on their agenda unless there's a crisis. And yet there is a pain and heartache that many black people experience in the workplace and many other public uh, institutions every day. And the stress of it all leads us to our graves earlier than what they should be. Because the research says that racism will kill. And we don't necessarily have to have a physical knee or bullets from police officers to kill us. Racism drives up high blood pressure and causes all other kinds of internal diseases in black and brown people. Many black people notice that they are treated differently in public spaces than their white counterparts. Often, and I'm certainly not suggesting that white people don't get bad customer services, but often what black people experience in this communities and in other communities across the country is getting much better, friendlier, smiling faces from white people to other white people. And when black people are next in line, they are often treated with indifference, insensitivity, and downright disrespect. Personally, whenever I get good customer service from anybody, 
sometimes I'm surprised because more times than not, it seems to be less than genuine and disrespectful. White dominant culture exhibits itself in so many different ways. Even some of the values of what we call middle class can be seen as undercurrents and elements that produce institutional racism. I wanna give a working definition to what I mean by white supremacy. But before I do that, I often when I give talks, I give a, a definition from Paul Kivel, the author of Uprooting Racism. Paul Kivel defines white racism as the uneven and unfair distribution of power, privilege, land, and material goods favoring white people. And what I simply like to say after that, it doesn't mean, here's another distinction, it doesn't mean that if you're white, you don't mean well. It doesn't mean that you're a bad person, mean-spirited, or hateful. But it means that the elements that this country was founded on, the doors of opportunity, advantages, and niceties open themselves much wider for white people. That's what we're talking about when we're talking about institutional racism, systemic racism, and white supremacy. And it's going to take some work for us to begin to dismantle that. But sometimes it's hard to get past the resistance, denial, and defensiveness, especially for people who are in power to even hear and really rethink about how we can create communities and organizations and institutions that are fair to everybody. Here's a working definition that I came up with some years ago for white supremacy. A practice or pattern in an organization, school, institution, or community where people of color are consistently left out and invisible when it comes to planning and building the culture of the organization. Here's the key. It often occurs without there being any malicious intent. So when we're talking about the system of racism and the culture of white supremacy, it's as American as baseball and apple pie. It is many of the norms and values that we assign ourselves to. It doesn't mean that all of those values are bad. What it means is that people of color are often left out when it comes to decision making. I say respectfully to our legal system, to many of our courthouses. I notice that as a black man, when I walk into a courthouse, the judges, the prosecutors, public defenders, security personnel, police officers, courthouse stenographers, secretaries, overwhelmingly, they are all white. To me, even with the many good things about the justice system, but to me and to many black people, given the history of how black people have been treated in the court system, Lady Justice is not blind. I have too many stories personally, and I know that many other black and brown people do, about how they get treated, not only in the criminal justice system, but as black professionals in schools, and whether they're a brain surgeon or any other capacity about how they are treated by other white people who are allegedly so-called professionals. As I begin to close, I don't want any of this to be heard. We are clear that there are many good social justice advocates who are white. And I know that many of them are right here on this Zoom platform. We can't fix maybe what's going on across the country, but the work that we have here in Utica and the Mohawk Valley, we have an opportune time and potential to create an environment 
and a community that is certainly doing better than what we have done historically. And I know that some of our elected officials have been paying attention, but I also know that it appears that this issue of racism, unless there's a literally and figuratively a burning building, it seems that there's much resistance um, towards this issue. Many of them get defensive and they're not even able to see their implicit bias and racism within themselves. And that becomes a roadblock to addressing this issue of what we call systemic racism and white supremacy. However, I am hopeful. I am hopeful because of the people, literally, that I see and the many people in this community that have raised their hands and have put much effort and work to this issue for better race relations. So for that reason, I am hopeful. I thank you for this time. I'm certainly open to questions if there's an opportunity for that at some point during this service. Carol, I wanna thank you and, and the others and all the other people who are on this call for even being willing to listen to this talk. Deeply grateful, thank you. That concludes my presentation. Thank you for your powerful words, Patrick. You have given us much to think about and Melissa will now introduce the next song. Yes, thank you. And there will be an opportunity to ask Patrick questions after the service, so keep an eye out for that. Oh, I woke up this morning with my mind stayed on Jesus. Stayed on Jesus, which is the original lyric to the spiritual gospel tune we're about to sing. Like many spirituals of the day, the song likely was using religious terms both as a structure to hold on to during the horror that was slavery and as a metaphor for the things you couldn't say aloud while their masters were present. However, the lyrics that we will sing stayed on freedom were adapted by Reverend Osby of Aurora, Illinois, while spending time in Hines County Jail during the Freedom Rides in the 1960s. And these lyrics have become a staple of the civil rights movement. So remember as we sing how long people have been fighting for their freedom, that so many in our world and our own neighborhoods are still fighting and still keeping their minds stayed on freedom. Stay on mute, but join in to sing number 153, Oh, I Woke Up This Morning. Woke up this morning with my mind. And it was stay, stayed on freedom. Woke up this morning with my mind. And it was stay, stayed on freedom. Woke up this morning with my mind. And it was stay, stayed on freedom. Hallelujah. 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 Walking, talking with my mind. And it was stay, stayed on freedom. Walking, talking with my mind. And it was stay, stayed on freedom. Walking and talking with my mind. And it was stay, stayed on freedom. Hallelujah. 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 Singing and praying with my mind, and it was stayed on freedom. Singing and praying with my mind, and it was stayed, stayed on freedom. Singing and praying with my mind, and it was stayed, stayed on freedom. Hallelujah! 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 My mind. And it was stayed, stayed on freedom. Woke up this morning with my mind. And it was stayed, stayed on freedom. Woke up this morning. 
Extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we meet again. The Benediction is another poem by Langston Hughes, also as true today as it was when written 70 years ago. Hold fast to dreams, for if dreams die, life is a broken winged bird that cannot fly. Hold fast to dreams. For when dreams go, life is a barren field, frozen with snow. Hold fast, my friends, hold fast. <laughs>